Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bienvenue à, à l'Ambassade du Canada. We're very, very happy to have you here with us today. We are really excited to be hosting so many inspiring women uh, here this afternoon from Canada and the U.S. and beyond. Women who, on a day-to-day -day basis, are making really positive contributions to advancing gender equality, the rights of women and girls around the world. And as I think all of you know, the evidence shows that when women and girls are more empowered, peace processes last longer, economies grow, public health improves, and greater sustainable development gains are made. And for this reason, Canada is deeply committed to fostering and supporting the leadership and participation of women at all levels of policy making. And of course, our partner group for this evening's event, the Women Foreign Policy Group, is, shares this commitment with us deeply. The Women Foreign Policy Group invests in women leaders like many of the women who are here today. Now yesterday I had the great honour and privilege of attending the funeral of Secretary Madeleine Albright, a leader who was also very deeply committed to women's empowerment. And she once observed that our collective experience has shown that when women have the power to make their own choices, good things happen. I hope you too will be inspired by these words as we listen to today's discussion between two remarkable women who are also making very good things happen. Today's conversation will be led by New York Times and WFPG board member Elizabeth Bumiller. Elizabeth is an assistant managing editor at the Times and the Washington bureau chief. Over the course of her distinguished career, she has been the Times City Hall Bureau Chief, a political correspondent, a White House correspondent, and a foreign correspondent. She's also a very accomplished author. Elizabeth will be moderating the discussion with Secretary Raimondo, who is a le leader and trailblazer in her own right. And she will have the pleasure of introducing her more fully. But before she does, I would just like to say how much Canada values our close relationship with the Secretary in her role as the 40th U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Her energy, her creativity, her practical and very results-oriented approach make her a really fantastic partner for us and for, for all, of, all of her government partners. So Elizabeth and Secretary, we're very delighted to have you here with us. Uh, please enjoy this conversation. Thank you very much for coming, Madam Secretary. Um, I was saying before this that it is not every day in Washington that the Commerce Secretary is in the absolute middle of everything. In many previous administrations, the Commerce Secretary was sort of off down here, and of course it was the Secretary of State, the Defense Secretary, this, um, uh, the uh, Treasury Secretary, but uh, Gina Raimondo is now in the hot, red hot center of everything that we're dealing with, including today. There was the GDP report showing that, um, that uh, the, the trade deficit was, was a, a negative factor on GDP, uh, growing trade deficit, inflation is up, we, there's supply chain problems, there are, um, we are putting sanctions on Russia, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are export controls uh, we're using against Russia, so there's just a thousand things to talk about right now. Mm -hmm. So let me, start, let me start with sanctions. Um, the Biden administration says it is it has imposed uh, the toughest sanctions ever on uh, on, a, on a country. So, to what degree are the sanctions on Russia working right now? Mm. So, first of all, thank you. It's fun to be with you, and Ambassador, thank you for hosting, and all of you for being here. It is true we could talk all night. Right. I mean, just one day's news today. It's unbelievable what's happening in the world. Um, the sanctions are unprecedented. The area of the sanctions that I'm responsible for are the export controls. Right. And they are unprecedented. They're unprecedented in a couple of ways. Unprecedented in the way we were able to galvanize a coalition of countries. So um, at the beginning of this, when we started working on this at the end of last year, we, America, we were prepared to use our extraterritorial tools. In other words, to, for example, in semiconductors, almost every semiconductor in the world is made with American software, and we could have gone into 
you know, Germany and such and said, you can't sell your semiconductors to Russia because it uses our equipment. We said, no, we're not going to do that. We built a coalition of 37 countries and aligned our export controls, and it is therefore more effective, easier to enforce, more enduring, and packs a much bigger punch. So essentially now, a couple of months into this, if you look at it, they're enormously effective. Russia's two biggest tank manufacturing operations have closed because they don't have spare parts. Lada, the auto company, has shut factories because they don't have the parts. Um, you're seeing they're struggling to continue to fly planes and repair planes because they can't, essentially they can't get any spare parts. Can't get semiconductors, which is in every piece of military equipment, can't get parts. We estimate that um, about, we and our partners in the Export Control Coalition, we estimate that we are den denying Russia about half of all of, the, all of their um, high-tech imports. So their technology imports have been cut in half since this started. So I think, now, I should also say, you know, enforcement is a piece of the puzzle. That was my next question. How are you, there? I mean, <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the stories by Anna Swanson, who's our fabulous yes, trade reporter fabulous. In, Washington, in the Washington Bureau, she is fabulous. Uh, described how there were people going into um, shipping containers in the ports and looking for parts that were being that were being illegally shipped overseas. This strikes me as rather low tech. Isn't there, <laughs> isn't there a better way of doing this? So uh, yes and no, which is to say <laughs> we have um, more sophisticated ways and we are using those sophisticated you know ways to track what's going on. Uh, but look, you know, sometimes you have to show up with agents and do the enforcement. And we are doing that as well. I mean, we have made a number of seizures. And you do have to show up um, because, you know, the bad guys don't follow the rules. But I'll say that in this regard, I can't say this enough times, because we have this coalition with dozens of countries, it's not just us doing the enforcement. So all of these countries who are also doing their export controls, they're doing enforcement. And so the level of collaboration between us and them and our Justice Department and our mm -hmm. intelligence community and you know, commerce, we have our own agents coordinating with them, we have a really tight, robust, global enforcement. But do you, how much evidence do you have of countries actually successfully evading or, or companies evading sanctions? So that is, of course, the question which we are asking ourselves. I would say some, some is happening. It would be wrong for me and naive to say there's no circumvention. However, there's no, there's no evidence that, for example, China or India or the UAE is systematically, um, significantly, and purposefully going around our export controls. It's more on the margin. And we have been crystal clear, and I'll double down again tonight, saying that we are going to use every tool at our disposal to the most aggressive posture possible to bring down the hammer on any countries that we find are doing an end run around our export controls. And they are extensive. And I think because these other countries know that, they're thinking twice before they try to end run around our controls. I have, I have so many follow-ups, I don't know where to start. <laughs> let me say, let me think about this. Um, the, uh, but Russia is still prosecuting the war. You know, you yeah. say that you've cut, you've cut their, yeah. their, te their technology imports in half, but they're still um, standing up an army, they are still fighting in the east, um, they are still lobbing missiles. There was an explosion in Kyiv today, as yeah. Biden, was you know, Day Biden spoke about you know, yeah. uh, the $33 billion the U.S. wants to send to Russia, or he wants to send to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. So uh, how long is this going to go on? How long can they last? So I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's a better question for the intelligence community or Secretary of Defense. I will say this. You saw, you see in the press, even the public reporting, the public reporting suggests they're running out of parts, they're running out of men, they're running, their words, and they're running out of uh, equipment. 
they can't last forever. And by the way, we knew when we sat down and we designed our administration's response, we said that the Treasury financial sanctions would have the most immediate effect. And, they, and that's, it's of course, yeah. true. And we said the export controls would take time. And we said, we're going to be at this war. We, you know, we are going to be at this for quite some time, right? And I would say, and our intelligence, obviously I can't share here, but our intelligence suggests the export controls are grinding them down. And so how long will it go on? I don't know. But I can tell you with almost certainty, a month from now, they're going to be struggling a lot more than they are now to keep the planes in the sky, to replenish their military weapons, to keep the tanks moving. Let me, let me switch. Um, well, let me ask you one more question about Russia. Um, t Biden announced today, uh, Congress, the House passed late last night, and Biden announced today that he wanted to um, use, uh, sell all the seized assets of the Russian oligarchs, like mostly the yachts, as far as we can tell, maybe some apartments, and use the, the proceeds to benefit humanitarian efforts and the war in Ukraine. Can you explain how that is actually going to work, and there's, aren't there going to be lawsuits about that? I mean, how do, who are you going to sell these yachts to? I don't know if you know that. Yeah, I, don't, I, I hate to say this, like I would say ask Secretary Yellen in the White House, because I have not been involved in that. I will say, I have to believe there's a way to do it, otherwise we wouldn't have rolled out that policy. Okay, okay. So I don't know. Well, let me go back to, um, let me go uh, talk to you about something you, I believe you've coined the term friend shoring. Is that yours? I don't know if I did it, but I say it a lot. Well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay. I have anyway, to take credit. In Detroit last November, you said you supported, the, a bi you, you supported big federal support to make chips in the United States so that we don't rely on foreign manufacturers to hold their conversation about chip yeah. semiconductors. Yeah. Um, you said then that commerce was doing what you called friend shoring mm. and that as quote, we rebuild our supply chains, we can't be dependent on foreign countries that don't share our values for our critical chip components. Correct. In other words, the administration was calling for US companies to relocate from China to friendly countries. Um, but what's a friendly country? Uh, and how are you going to make this a policy? Is this a policy you're going to uh, establish? Is this a law? How are you going to do this other than calling for it? Yeah. So Canada is a friendly country. <laughs> but what about India? Is India, India is just absolutely a friend, okay. friendly is country. Is India a friendly country? Listen, you, you, you make an excellent point. And sadly, um, it's a shrinking list, not a growing list. Uh, and it will be case by case. Uh, here's what I will tell you. One of the efforts I'm leading for the administration is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is the administration's affirmative economic plan for the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. has been essentially absent from that region for five years. And it's, you know, we, so Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, friendly, but we need to show up and do more with them so they, you know, remain friendly and become even more friendly. And so um, apart from Mexico, Canada, Europe, you know, we have many friendly places, but I think it's, is there a rule of law? Is there a stable government? Do you protect uh, privacy and individual rights, human rights abuses? I mean, it is a spectrum and it is not a law. It is absolutely not a law, but the point of it is, there are certain countries, like China, that are absolutely not friendly right. and getting less friendly. And we are very reliant. And you talk about semiconductors. The United States now purchases about 70% of the most sophisticated semiconductors from Taiwan. Right. That is a massive national security risk. So we ought to make that those chips in America or in Europe. So anyway, it's. Um, but how do you uh, 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 induce, entice a, com a company to relocate from China to Canada? Uh, do you, are there tax credits you're going to offer? You can't just say they should do it. You have. What do you? What is the policy going to be if there is going to be a policy? Well, I'd say first of all, China's not doing itself any favors. I mean, it's becoming increasingly difficult. I hear every day from American companies about you know more discriminatory, anti-competitive, 
difficult um, behavior by the Chinese government in China. But I think it's like the, the back to this Indo-Pacific economic framework. We're looking to have a broad, you know, inclusive group of countries in the Indo-Pacific that sign on to a framework. That, and? and that means more commercial activity. As that means more U.S. private sector engagement in their countries, more U.S. capital to Indonesia, Malaysia, etc. And Malaysia is a perfect example. Malaysia now has many packaging comp semiconductor packaging companies. We ought to do more of that, right? We ought to do more of that. And and they're going to hopefully they will sign on to the principles of of this framework, you know, privacy, uh, data privacy in data flows, rule of law, you know, they don't have to have precisely our form of government, but it has to, companies, we, we won't provide tax incentives, but companies want to go to places where they feel safe, where they feel the government is not corrupt, where they feel there's predictability, and so it's, um, What's it's this is the, this is like t sowing the soil to make this happen. So what kind of feedback are you getting from CEOs in the United States? Have you talked to them a lot about Very it? positive. There's increasing interest in, um, in this. You know, I mean, there, I, I talked without revealing names. You, you talk to a number of companies who already have their plans to, um, you know, exit China or just be closer to America. I mean, COVID, if we learn one thing in COVID, right. we learned that our supply chains are incredibly vulnerable, fragile, and much too far away. So you talk about incentives. You know, companies want to be in places where are closer to them, where there's a value around human rights, there's a value around transparency, there's a value around climate and sustainability, and they want, they want some diversity in their supply chain. There's like massive risk if all your supply chain is in one or two countries in Southeast Asia. So the companies I'm talking to have been really, I have had their eyes opened to the vulnerability in their supply chain, and they're engaging with us. I will say the demand is high. I'm not selling them. They're coming to me. Well, let me, let me ask you this. We've heard that um, the administration is also looking into new restrictions on outbound U.S. investments into Chinese companies, yeah. in addition to the existing restrictions on, restrictions on Chinese investments here. So do you feel that you must feel those additional restrictions, are they necessary? Yes, yes, and absolutely. That, and that is because? Uh, there's an a awful lot of um, U.S. capital that that flows to China every year into um, emerging technology that is core to our national security. And we, at this time, don't have a method in the federal government to you know, track that, screen that, and have some control over that. And I think we need to. And you know, precisely what that looks like, we have to you know, work with Congress. The same thing um, for the inbound investment. Right. So for a long time, or several years anyway, the U.S. government does track and screen Chinese investment into the U.S., but it's mostly big mergers and acquisitions, you know, uh, purchasing, a, purchasing a, con a piece of a conglomerate. You know, a big U.S. company wants to sell a division, China wants to buy it. That goes through a screening process called CFIUS. But what we don't right. screen is private capital. Money from China coming into a U.S. venture firm that gets invested in artificial intelligence or any kind of emerging technology, we don't, screen it, we don't screen that. So there's a lot of private capital from high net worth individuals that comes into the U.S. We do need to, I believe, tighten up on that because a lot of it's going into our most sophisticated emerging technology. So there isn't uh, an effort underway to yes. restrict that? Yes. You see some bills in Congress, the administration's working on it. Obviously, there's a lot of opinions on how to do this, but it is something that I think there's broad agreement that we need to focus on. Well, let me ask you this. Um, do you, 
is, are, is the goal to shut down trade with China? No. That is so not what the is the goal? That is absolutely not the goal. It, that is not a good goal. That's not good for American business or economy or our growth. The goal is to have a level playing field and to enable American companies and workers to compete. And China's anti-competitive, coercive, uh, massively market distorting behavior doesn't enable that. So the goal is what I said, to enable competition and the goal is to make sure we protect our technology, like our most sophisticated intellectual property. The reality is the vast majority of our trade with China is like what you might call benign goods and services. It's not the most sophisticated semiconductors and software and AI and stuff that I'm talking about. And you know what what is it? It's clothing, food, clothes, furniture, uh, uh, what's that? Gadgets. Gadgets. <laughs> Consumer electronics. <laughs> Gadgets. Yeah. Right. Uh, and we ought to continue to do, tr absolutely. You know, and, and I would say, game on, let's compete. But there has to be a semblance of a level playing field and playing by similar rules. And so it's about, you know, protecting our IP and sticking up for American industry. Um, but enabling trade. When you deal with Chinese, your counterparts in China, what what is it? What are they like? What? Are, how do they respond to you? Um, I, have you, I can't remember how much how recently you've been to China. It's, I have not because there's been COVID, no travel right, since right. I've only been in the so, job for. We haven't had. I would say since I've been here, there hasn't been extensive. Um, you've not met interaction. No, they haven't left. They don't, they don't leave. Right. They don't leave. We've had some phone calls. I haven't gone. I am actually quite hopeful that that resumes at some point relatively soon. Let me, speaking of semiconductors, let me talk to you about the fact yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the CEO of Ford said that there is a giant holdup on cars because uh, they reported their earnings yesterday and they said that there were 50,000 vehicles just sitting around waiting yeah. for chips because of the supply chain problem. And obviously cars are a huge factor in inflation. So, um, you know, there, there's, a, there, there's these new, these companies have announced these big investments in chip factories, but that's not gonna, they're not gonna be online for five years at the earliest. So, I need to address this, but what can mm. you do? Yeah. Sh short of waiting for five, you know. Because as you yeah. said, our, it's a national security problem that Taiwan ships, that we get 70% of our chips from Taiwan. Yeah, so the, I wish there were an easy solution to this, and there, there is not. We are doing some things in the short run to increase transparency in the supply chain, working very closely with companies in the supply chain to try to match supply and demand wherever there's excess supply, help increase transparency to fill the demand. For example, you talked about Ford, on account of out my our convenings of the suppliers and consumers, Ford created a partnership with Global Foundries, which is a semiconductor company, and they're working closely together. So, but very truthfully, all of this is on the margin. But I was gonna say. All was, of this is on the margin. It's, and, and I talk to CEOs of major companies who are themselves s searching for like five to 10 chips at a time. So the margin <laughs> matters. Like greatness is made on the margin, as they well, that's say. that's five to 10 cars, I guess, Yes, right? so, you know, I don't know about that, but it's. Yeah. The margin matters, and we, and we are digging into this very deeply. And we're working with the Department of Defense on some other creative ideas to help companies maybe improve their equipment, increase their capacity. You know, they have existing fabs. How do we get more capacity and efficiency out of the existing fabs? But truly, the only solution is for Congress, as quickly as possible, to do its job and pass this law. And by the way, it won't be five years, because I believe there's quite a bit of capital, private capital, on the sidelines now. American semiconductor companies holding back their investments and their announcements, waiting for some, some 
security that this bill will happen. And I think when this bill is, you know, President signs it, it'll be a signal to the market to start spending. But there's a big, there's a hold up. There's a lot of, I mean, what, what is the, how much are you up there lobbying for it? Constantly. Okay. And what, what is the latest hold up? <laughs> um, mm. Well, we're making progress, I would say. <laughs> right. uh, making progress. They've announced conferee. They've agreed to go to conference. That's a big step. You know, Congress is back in town this week. They've agreed to go to conference. Um, the Senate is going to be voting on the MTIs, I think, next week. So they're moving. They're moving. And that is all good. But they just need to pick up the pace. The holdup is nothing specifically. The holdup is foot dragging um, at a time we need action. So I am hopeful that the foot dragging ends. They all get a greater sense of urgency. And in the next couple of months, we get this over the finish line. I, I forgot to ask you a question about trade with Russia. We still do some trade with Russia, despite the sanctions. Yeah. What, is, what is left? What, is, what are kind of goods of the U.S.? It's very limited, obviously, as you might expect. Our trade with Russia has fallen very considerably. Um, there's some limited amount of medical supplies. Um, that we send them. Yeah, that right. we send them. Medical supplies that we send to them, uh, some equipment, tractors. It's, it's, I don't have the full list, but it's, it's very small. And do they, what, do they, what do they send to us? It's also very small. Some limited quantities of steel, for example. Some um, limited quantities of critical minerals, uranium, palladium. So the, the rationale for continuing that is just what? It may not last forever, you know, which is to say when we began this, we began with a certain amount of sanctions, and we ratcheted up, and we are ratcheting it up continuously, um, and we are going to continue to do what we need to do. You know, so for example, in the Commerce Department, we are continuing every week, every week, it doesn't make the press, nor should it, but every week we add you know, more products that we're controlling, more companies, you know, more countries, uh, and we're going to continue to tighten the screws as necessary until Putin ends this war. Let me ask you about um, inflation, which was part of the GDP problem today, although as we reported, it, the, it's, the GDP number is not as bad as it looks. Mm -hmm. But anyway. I uh, think that's true. And inflation. Right. So, um, you know, obviously gas prices have been a huge drag uh, on the economy, um, cars. What, <laughs> I hate to ask you this because I think I know what the answer is to be, what can you do to <laughs> ease, what can the Commerce Department do? or the Biden administration do to ease the yeah. cost of food, gas, yeah. cars, so everything? The Commerce Department, just I am a broken record on this, and I really believe it, in this competition bill, the USICA bill, the competes bill, whatever you want to call it, it, that is the best thing we can do long term for inflation. Because cars, increased car prices, are about a third of inflation. 100% linked to lack of chips and decreased supply. Right. There's a supply. Do you know in the United States of government, we don't have any real um, infrastructure or department to, on a continuous basis, manage the civilian supply chain? It's what kind of the civilian it, supply chain? Well, mean? not the defense industrial base. So, for example, in Japan or right. Germany, they have whole departments who continuously map and monitor the supply chain and provide loans to small and medium-sized manufacturers in the supply chain. We don't do that. Should we? Oh, absolutely we should. And why don't we do it? I don't know. It's time to do it, and it's in this bill. I'm trying to get Congress <laughs> to pass. But in the, past 20, <laughs> in the past 25 years, you must be a small and medium-sized manufacturer. <laughs> in the past 25 years, America has lost 25% of its small and medium-sized manufacturers. I come from a state, you see it wherever you go. It used to be in Rhode Island, we were chuck full of small and medium-sized 
jewelry manufacturers, metal works, tool works, all gone, all around the country. As a result, we have a supply chain crisis, which is driving up inflation. So what are we going to do at the Commerce Department long term is build up again our supply chain so this doesn't happen. Anyway, in the short run, I, mean, I think the administration is pulling every lever we have to improve supply chain bottlenecks. All the work we did on the ports made a difference. Port congestion is way down. We're training truck drivers faster than we ever have, making it easier to train truck drivers. Um, as we talked about briefly before, supply chains in the U.S. are run by the private sector. So we're limited in that. The president is doing everything he can do and knows how to do with respect to oil prices. You know, a million barrels a day of the petroleum reserve, you know, working to um, put pressure on companies to, you know, here in the U.S., working with oil and gas companies. But the, I, wish, I wish there were a flick of the switch. As we all also know, the Fed has the most powerful tools right. as it relates to monetary policy. And by the way, the Fed had a big hand in leading us to where we are. I mean, the Fed's monetary policy in the beginning of the pandemic, there were days in the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020 where the Fed was doing more bond purchasing and asset purchasing than they were doing in a month back in the financial crisis. One day versus one month. Now, I'm not criticizing them because that was their decision that they made as an independent agency in the teeth of that crisis. But what I am saying is that was a historic loose monetary policy, and they have the tools at their disposal to get inflation under control. But it's, I'm not in any way diminishing the challenge. You know, I see it. As a former governor, I see it. People are struggling. It's real. So how, uh, as a former governor and a former um, elected official, which you are not now, how concerned are you about um, the impact of inflation on the midterms and the 2024 election? Yeah. Um, you know, I, of course, wish that the American public were giving the president a little more credit for the fact that the economy, I mean, it, it is amazing to me. Just permit me to say this, and I'll answer your question, but I was the governor in the beginning of this pandemic. I ran a state of a million people. We, at one point in time, had 110,000 people on unemployment in Rhode Island. I still, when I say that, I, I'm feeling again the pit in my stomach that I felt then. I didn't know what I was going to do. And if you told me then, Gina, a couple years from now, we'll be at full employment, wages will be up, the economy will be growing at the fastest pace in 40 years, there'll be plentiful jobs, I would not have believed you. So I think the administration, the president, deserves enormous credit for that. Now, of course, we're dealing with inflation. Yes, it's a worry. But you, you cannot not worry about it. People see it every day. Uh, but they're also seeing their wages going up. They're, in, they're employed. They will increasingly start to see infrastructure projects in their backyard. Increasing. Although, are they going to say, oh, Joe Biden did that? I that's, hope so. I think the, so. That's the I other hope so, and I think so. They should. They should, and every time I talk to a governor or a mayor, I was with the group of mayors today, I remind them that they ought to, you know, think about carrying that message into their community. P you know, people will see it. The thing I'm in charge of is broadband, bringing broadband to people. As people start to see, well, they're getting broadband. Their kids are getting broadband. Broadband's more affordable. The, there's fewer potholes in their backyard. They're fixing the bridges. I, that will all accrue politically to the benefit of Democrats, I think. So, and I have about a few, I have a couple questions left, and then okay. I'm gonna open it up to the crowd. Um, but just, let me just ask one last question. Which job is, was harder? <laughs> <laughs> Governor or Commerce Secretary in, in yeah. this incredibly uh, difficult economic moment? Yeah, so they're both great. <laughs> um, we were talking earlier. Uh, they're different, they're very different. I was saying, the stress and pressure of being an elected official and the highest ranking elected official in your area is 
for me personally was a greater level of stress and pressure. Um, it was also immensely gratifying. What I miss terribly, I miss so much, is meeting the people in my community who I was serving. I love that more than anything about the job. Meeting somebody in the community who says, hey, my daughter's going to community college tuition free and never could have done that if it weren't for your work. So I, I you know, you don't get that in this job. You don't get that in this job. Um, in this job, though, an opportunity to serve at the highest level at a moment when America needs is like calling everyone to serve is truly an honor of a lifetime, and I do love that. Okay, thank you. So I've got two questions here, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody. This is from somebody in the audience. Uh, so, how is your department working with the government, with other government agencies, to implement the national gender policy goals to address online violence against women? So we are um, totally integrated with other departments on this. It's being led by the White House. And we, mostly what we are working on um, in my department is a women's initiative in the care economy and constantly trying to work with Congress to make the investments necessary to improve child care, to provide child care, and to bring about universal pre-K. And what I always say is, don't tell me those are social issues. Those are core economic issues to get women back into the workforce. And so we're working, you know, primarily, that's sort of what we're doing mainly, working with the, um, with the interagency around gender issues. Um, here's another question. This is very much uh, uh, a very specialized question. What avenues are looking most promising in terms of convincing Asian nations beyond Singapore to join IPEF? since the administration has said it will not negotiate market access in the IPEF. Is it capacity building promotion of infrastructure? Yes, so the avenues, first of all, I am personally doing a great deal of outreach and I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very optimistic. The demand coming from the region for us to be back in the region is so strong. And we're gonna show up and deliver uh, I think it is, yes, is the answer to your question, infrastructure money flowing to the region, clean tech money uh, and know-how flowing to the region, uh, increased digital trade, uh, which is very real and interesting for the region. Um, I think that we are committed to making sure that there are real and tangible and robust um, benefits for the region way beyond Singapore. By the way, our mission is to make this ambitious and inclusive. You know, we, we would like Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Japan, India, Korea. We want a big tent and uh, we will make sure that it is ambitious and tangible. Um, last question, but, but then I will ask the audience. Also, sorry. Uh, no, this is, this is also, don't oh, forget about supply chains. <coughs> we just talked about s supply chains. They're struggling as much as we are with supply chains. Let's work together. Create jobs there, create jobs here. Work together, share information, mutually map, you know, imp improve our resiliency. So I'm, as you can tell, excited about it, and I think there's a lot of real work to be done. Um, this question, I think, is from Canada. How do you see Canada's role in securing a <laughs> supply of critical minerals for U.S. needs in the near term? I think it's a big role, Ambassador. Maybe that's your question. <laughs> um, we need partnership agreements with all of our allies around specific critical minerals um, that you have. So the other day I hosted a roundtable with my counterpart from Australia, who will also be in the Indo-Pacific Framework, and we had maybe 20 CEOs of mining companies, critical mineral companies. We want to do more business with them. It's, you know, we need to do more processing in the United States. We need to work with those companies, and the same is true for Canada. Uh, we are, we are over-dependent on the wrong countries for our critical minerals. 